Hello and thank you for joining us on the Thursday edition of Journalist Hangout. I'm Ayodili Uzubakum. Today on the program, Nigeria emerges the most terrorized country in Africa, ranked worse than Syria, Yemen, Somalia and Pakistan. And later on the show, Attorney General Abubakar Malami expresses readiness to testify against Ibrahim Magu has suspended EFCC Chairman Diazim to show evidence that he received bribes and enriched himself. I'll be hanging out with Babajide Kolade Otitoju and Wale Adewi will be joining us via Skype. So if you are ready, let the hangout start now. Thank you for staying with us. Now, a few years ago, terrorism seemed to seem a remote term and unlikely experience to Nigerians. But after more than a decade of Boko Haram insurgency in the country's northeast, terrorism is now a commonplace. Nigeria now ranks third among the most terrorized country in the world. According to the latest reports by the Global Terrorism Index, the incident attacks by Boko Haram and armed bandits puts Nigeria just behind Afghanistan and Iraq as the most terrorized countries in the world. Worse than the likes of Syria, Yemen, Somalia, and Pakistan. Jiri, this is strange. These names, you know, when you talk about Yemen, and it, <laughs> what comes to my uh, what comes to my mind is like a photo of a failed state. When you talk about Syria, Syria is have been under heavy bombardment in the last <laughs> um, ten years, you know, so. And because of the civil war they have within Syria. So how will, how on earth will Nigeria be categorized with these countries? Well, it is not um, a surprise to me that uh, this has happened. And um, this survey uh, was conducted in 2018. Um, so it may not reflect exactly what is going on now. Exactly what's going on now could even be worse than this. Like that 2018 18. when it was conducted. Yes. So 2018. So still better than what we have. 2018. Now. Um, my suspicion is that it could be worse now, because we have moved now. See, uh, insecurity has become our biggest problem as a country now. Except we want to deceive ourselves. The rate of killings across the country is significantly higher than. 2018. So I'm saying that this was conducted in 2018, but the rate of fatalities based on their survey uh, showed that the 2018 um, outcome was 75 percent even lower than 2014. You know that 2014 was the peak of the Boko Haram insurgency. That was the year that they um, invaded uh, Goza and annexed it and moved from Goza to Damboa. And from then, they began to capture territories and hoist their flag. In the end, they captured like 17 local governments in, in Borno State, went to Adama and captured seven local governments, went to Yobe and captured two local governments. You know? So things are um, much better in terms of the Boko Haram war and their capacity to seize territories. But the notoriety of Boko Haram has not reduced. They still continue to attack our people. They continue to kill our people. In one day, in one day in the month of May, if you remember, they killed 100 persons in one town, in Ganze local government of Borno State. So when you talk about Iraq, uh, Yemen, and Syria. Syria, because of the sustained bombardment of ISIS positions and all that, the success of the military campaign led by the Russians and the Americans, they've been able to bring down the number of innocent civilians being killed. Because when you are talking about the definition of um, terrorism, it is an act designed to cause bodily harm to civilians as a means of 
um, stimulating a reaction either from a government or a non-government agency, maybe like an NGO or um, um, some organization that can then bring money and pay for uh, after, it's, uh, after uh, you've taken action. They can then pay you maybe ransom or uh, beg, beg you to uh, stop that course of action. So the same thing in Iraq, the gains that uh, Islamic State made over the years have been eroded because of sustained military action. So they do no longer control territories inside Iraq. They've cleared them out of the territories that they used to hold. But terrorist attacks are still taking place. Now, why this figure is this high in Nigeria is based largely on the activities of criminal headsmen. Criminal headsmen, according to these figures, accounted for more than 70% of even the deaths that were recorded uh, during that period. Because activities of bandits all over. Yes. So 78% of attacks during that period were carried out by, um, uh, uh, what was it called, criminal headsmen. Uh, because criminal headsmen were the ones attacking people in, in um, um, most parts of Kaduna, and even many parts of the North Central. So they are saying that 86% of deaths mm. from uh, in Nigeria in 2018 came from those headsmen. A lot of the bandits operating in, in, uh, in, 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 in the Northwest, Zamfara, and the rest of them are classified as criminal headsmen. So they are saying, okay, 86% of deaths uh, arose from the activities of these guys. So uh, when you look at the uh, the figure of the dead, you see that Boko Haram was said to have killed 589 Nigerians in 2018, whereas um, the criminal headsmen, that's how I want to be describing them, mm -hmm. so that nobody says you are targeting a particular tribe. Mm -hmm. um, they killed, criminal headsmen killed 1,158. Mm -hmm. I want to believe that a lot of this 1,158 must have been killed in Zamfara because that was the peak of the killings. In Zamfara State. Yes, that I was the peak know. of the killings, and we are doing programs almost every day talking about the need to Zamfara. put an end to this. Yes, and it didn't yeah. stop until um, 2019. It didn't really significantly come down. Again. So this is the thing. Yes, there is a war in Yemen, uh, but this is terrorism that we are talking about. Yes, there will be occasional bombing and killing of innocent people. But when you look at um, the activities of terrorists, you see them in form of what the Taliban is doing in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see them in form of what ISIS is doing in Iraq. You see them in form of what ISIS is doing in Syria as well. So those figures have gone down for some of the countries. But for Nigeria, <laughs> the, the way things are going, if they do a survey for 2019, and uh, 2020, I'm sure it will be higher than this. Yeah. Wale Adui, this ranking <laughs> of Nigeria, are you surprised in any way? I'm not surprised by these uh, figures because, first of all, we need to be very honest with our situation. We should not politicize it. We should admit the reality of the challenge that faces us as a country. So I think just like uh, Baba Gide said, uh, before we used to have religious terrorism, now it has been joined by criminal terrorism, pastoral terrorism, people that are involved in terrorism with the end product, with the, with, with the aim of making material gains. So I think that has compounded you know, the problem that Nigeria faces. And unfortunately, it appears as if the figures of deaths keep on rising almost every day. Even during COVID-19 pandemic, there are a lot of people who are expected to stay at home, mm -hmm. to stay with their families. People are being massacred in Nigeria. So that, that is a very unfortunate thing because if you look at the trend all over the world, during the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, the figures actually, you know, uh, was down, you know, at the peak of COVID-19 pandemic. But in Nigeria, it was, the reverse was the case. People are being massacred, people are being killed. So I think I agree with that uh, report. 
2018. And I also believe that if we are to do a review this year, I'm quite convinced that uh, the figure will have gone up. Unfortunately, the conditions for the breeding, that crazy breeding ground for terrorism, like poverty, deprivation, lack of education, desperation, exclusion, economic exclusion, those conditions uh, are still here. And of course, corruption will also continue to aid terrorism. Because it's like as if a lot of people see this fight as a way to, you know, uh, to make money. You remember the case of this, uh, the National Security Advisor, $2.2 billion. You know, we are still talking about how that money disappeared. So I, I think Nigeria is in a very uh, big problem. We need to admit the problem and we need to work together collectively so that we can bring this uh, to an end. It's very unfortunate that the country that used to be the giant of Africa has now become the most terrorized country in Africa. This is not a good, um, this is not a good rating for us. We need to admit this reality and then uh, work out a solution that can make us to redeem our very bad image. Redeeming a very bad image, what are you doing there? And then, um, why do you think the figure is rising in Nigeria? Is it as a result that we don't, um, uh, 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 the willpower on the part of governments, have they lost control? This administration, they've been, at, uh, the Muhammad Wari led administration in the last five years inherited Boko Haram, the Boko Haram insurgency. They've not, uh, they've not eliminated the uh, the terrorists, and then um, now the bandits are all over, not east, not west, not everywhere. Yeah. Um, we have not done enough to crush these criminals because I want to see them largely as criminals now. Um, you cannot say what Boko Haram is fighting for is um, has anything to do with religion. No. Uh, back then, when they were attacking churches, remember the uh, Christmas Day bombing, mm. and they were attacking churches in Kaduna and all the, yes, you could say it had religious coloration, but that's not the case now. And Muslims are by far the greatest um, the, 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 um, victims, especially of Boko Haram um, um, conflict. Mm. Boko Haram insurgency, Muslims are by far the greater victims so they want to create the, that no, the question that is the religious thing the, in, back in, then back mm. then be, no you see Boko Haram wanted to start a religious war yes they yes. wanted Christian and Muslims to kill themselves in Nigeria mm. in the beginning they were going for Christians mm. that didn't work. it got so bad that look they were installing huge gates before churches in, in, at the beginning the of the Sunday your streets, Sunday thing in Kano and other places they were going after Christians. Remember the Sunday, the Christmas Day bombing in, in Suleja, you know? But when they saw that the Christians and the Muslims didn't turn against themselves, then they got angry and said, okay, you Muslims and, uh, that you refuse to uh, kill Christians, you who refuse to kill yourselves, then we'll go for you. So they started attacking mosques attacking muslims imams. and yes mm -hmm. killing imams who preached against them mm -hmm. killing uh, remember uh, um, one of the uh, great heroes of the civil nigerian civil war from borno state they went to his house killed him they were now targeting big people and killing them as a way of instigating a bigger conflict so this is the thing we've not been able to crush them and because of that order from within the boko haram Groups are, are getting up, factions are being created, they are now seeking sh uh, uh, refuge away from their base mm -hmm. to go and start their own. Also. And I will explain how. Remember when Boko Haram broke up in August 2016, the Albanawi faction had to go to the fringes of the Lake Chad to set up and left Shekau in Sambisa Forest. Mm. Now we are told that some factions of Boko Haram have relocated to some parts of uh, Northwest and some parts of uh, North Central. They are now in Niger, Shekau's faction. Mm. Some of their own uh, um, uh, men are now in the mm. North Central. They even had the audacity to post their pictures on Saladay. 
to say yes, we are in Niger State now because there are extensive forests in that in that uh, part of the country. It's the largest uh, state by landmass in Nigeria, followed by Bono and uh, Rantaraba states. So they are there now, causing all kinds of uh, havoc, killing people. So until we crush them, deploy all that is at our disposal, until we look at the strategy that we are even deploying and see that bandits are people who do not deserve to exist in our country, we we'll crush them. Until we do that, these uh, uh, figures will be rising. Mm. And I, just as I said earlier, if they are to do it, because 2018 was better than this. What we are having now, everyone can see clearly that is, uh, security is our greatest problem. There has never been a time when Nigerians were pushing for the removal of service chiefs like they have done this year. And the president knows it. So if we can, if people can be shouting, solve our problem, uh, do something about security, it shows that mm. more people have died this year mm. than uh, previous years. So we just have to keep on working hard. Let's beef up the number of our troops because we don't have enough and they are overstretched. Even the police, we need to continue to recruit, but we must recruit the right people, not never do well, mm. and, uh, and people who, who, who are no better than arm robbers. So mm. there are things that we need to do to, 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 to get to the promised land. Wale, why do you think this government has refused to change its strategy on security? Well, I, I think the, the service chiefs, perhaps in the history of Nigeria, should, the current... Uh, um, people in, in occupying these positions should be uh, some of the longest serving service chiefs. Um, it is quite unfortunate that, um, I mean, they spent more than four years, and uh, we, we, we think that after, uh, I mean, it, it's time for, for, for them to consider to, 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 I mean, to change the strategy that they have employed over these years. I don't understand how the mind of the presidency works. But I think many Nigerians would like to see a change in strategy. If not, if not, we are not going to have a change in the personnel. But at least there should be a kind of change in strategy because we have been using the same strategy for the past four years. And we seem not to be making progress. Especially now that we're having so many factions, different forms coming up with different names. Then we need to review our, our strategy and to ensure that uh, we do something about it to ensure that we don't just continue to use the past strategy we have been using over the years, mm -hmm. which seems not to be working. Hmm. But actually, it's so unfortunate that we even have them, from the latest reports we read this morning, no. spreading to parts of Abuja. Yes, the, once you are unable to crush them, once they keep getting away with their activities, their criminal activities, then they would begin to extend their tentacles to areas that were hitherto uh, deemed to be safe. Mm -hmm. So you see now that the Guagualada area of Kaduna, the Zuba area of Kaduna is under threat. If bandits can uh, uh, go to, to, to Gamaji, or how is it pronounced, go to that place, they got to the place around 12 midnight, and they operated for about one and a half hours, mm -hmm. moving from house to house taking people away, unrestrained. In Abuja. That's, you, know, you know Abuja, you know Zuba. There's no reason in the world, no reason in the world, because that place is too close to the seat of power. Mm. There's no reason in the world for criminals to go no, to, operate to a place that hour. close. That emergency will not come. Because when I you mean, live, after, uh, it's after Gwagwalada. Yes. Yeah. It's after Gwagwalada yeah. that you get to that uh, mm. uh, village. It's too close to Abuja for this nonsense to happen. Helicopter now, can be deployed, they will, everything yes, can be at least people deployed. can raise alarm. How do we even respond to this kind of things in our country? Technology is, is important. Every Nigerian should be able to raise alarm. And when he raises alarm to the security agencies, they should be able to respond in record time, hmm. in a jiffy. That is the beauty of it. But if you raise alarm and uh, the policemen... Their are vehicles, maybe at the nearest police station, the vans are not they serviceable. They have their own limitations. Their, 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 their tires are mm. already uh, deflated. How do they respond? We've mm. seen policemen sometimes, when you call them to say, look, 
come and save us from criminals, they will tell you that there is no vehicle to step out of their, of their uh, police station. Mm -hmm. So who will save our people? Mm -hmm. We and need to look holistically at these problems and find uh, a, a solution. I think we we'll have our first caller. I think he's calling us from Lagos. Hello. Yes. How are you today? Thank you for joining us. Yeah, my greeting to Mabagide and yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my, what I'm saying is very simple. If a club is losing a match, which means the players don't like the manager. So once they change the manager, the same player, give them winning the match. So you ask yourself, what's going on? So that is exactly what I can tell you about what is happening in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Until they change the charity, the morale of the personnel will keep on going down. Mm -hmm. They are not happy. That's what you are seeing. That's the result you are seeing. Watch it. If they change them, come and see. You will be surprised that the same forces are the one now fighting terrorism or bandits, ready to put their life on the line. So you will see what will happen. But well, keeping them there, <laughs> they are more out there. even in the police, the same thing. <laughs> because some people are not happy. Maybe they are about promotion or whatever. So we need prayer, but we need action. So we appeal to our president, we love him, to help us to replace the services. And let's see how things go. Because security is a problem. We are afraid to come home. Because not everybody can be paying for security here and there. <laughs> Nowhere is safe now. Everybody is watching all over the world. God will bless you, Baba Gita, and uh, my dear brother. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, the, from the United Kingdom. In my mm -hmm. view, we're talking about service chiefs, mm. but we have other security agencies beyond the army, the police, I mean, beyond the army, the Air Force, and the Navy. This kind of um, security threats that we are even talking about, they are better addressed by so policemen. Policemen can do a good job of dealing with these bandits if they have all that it takes. Yeah, because it is internal security. Yes, if they have all that it takes. For example, if you put APCs and other equipment in police stations, mm. if they have enough, they will be able to get into the APCs because they know it offers them protection and go after mm. these bandits. I've seen policemen who had eight pieces at their disposal. I've seen them dislodge Boko Haram in Borno State. They even went as far as rescuing soldiers who were taken away by Boko Haram. Mm. That is the beauty of having the right equipment. Goodness. We must equip our police sufficiently. We must come up with our laws mm. that will ensure that policemen, I mean, that part of even the, the, the profit coming from corporate concerns, mm. go to the funding of the police. No. If we don't do that, the police will remain underfunded and they will not be able to deliver. The mm. army has no business going after bandits. Internal security. Yes, they have no business going after But they are the ones that we are using. We are depending heavily on them now. States. And they have shown that, even the army has shown that, they are not uh, miracle workers. Mm. See what happened in, uh, in Kasina. In Jibia local government, Shinfida local government, uh, Shinfida uh, village, they, they, they killed our soldiers. They killed many of them. Hmm. Bandits. Hmm. Okay, I'll take this commercial break. When we come back, we'll talk more. We're still journalists and hangouts. We'll be right back after this time out. Please stay with us. Thank you for joining us. This is your multi-award winning program, Journalist Hangout. We're reaching you from TVC News here in Lagos, Nigeria. And we are looking at the Global Terrorism Index. And um, it's not looking nice for uh, uh, Nigeria. Now, Wale, now, how can we keep this terrorist in check? And, you know, I've, I've attended some programs that your organization you, that you've um, put together and... You've always, you, um, you, you're always coming up with communicate ideas on how to keep um, security intact across uh, the country. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be working with uh, international partners like Ford Foundation and uh, other groups like that. Uh, and our finding is that um, we need a multi-dimensional approach. 
we've talking about military solution. Uh, there should also be economic solution. There should also be the involvement of communities because it's there are communities that are under siege. So we should not assume that you know, uh, fighting terrorism is just the function of the government alone. Communities need to be deeply involved. If you go, if you look at some of these terrorists, they are from one farmstead, one community or the other. They are known by certain people. They were given birth by certain parents who know how they grew up, who know their background. So communities, who are, if communities are involved, they will be able to assist the government in terms of providing relevant information. Then we have also discovered that even though you can use guns and weapons to kill terrorists, but terrorism itself as a concept is a different game entirely. You must be able to, con uh, to create a situation where people will not be vulnerable to being recruited by terrorist organizations. People must have jobs. People must have things that keep them busy. Even as important as things like sports. Where people are growing up with those days, there are so many sport, uh, sport activities that people get involved that keep them busy. But because when you look at these terrorists, most of the people that they use are young people who are green, who are, you know, who, who, are, who, are, who, are, who, are, who are green and in a, in a situation that they are raw. They can be, you know, their, their, their mentality can be, can be manipulated. Nice. Young people of 18, 21, you know, who are adventurous. You know, they, they don't have children. You know, life is just a game for them. So these, these people, if you don't capture them at the right time to engage them uh, in a constructive manner, they are most, uh, most likely they will be engaged by terrorist organizations to put them for peanuts. So we need a multidimensional approach. And also the economic aspect is very important because terrorism is eating deep on fiscal policy of the country. We are spending so much billions to buy weapons, to buy guns, at the expense you know, of investing in utilities, Perfect. in water, in health, in job creation. And then we also have to reduce the cost of governance. For instance, the National Assembly will spend about 20 billion every year. So in a term, you, I mean, in a term of four years, you are talking about 79 billion naira. More so than people, 20 the billion. people in power <laughs> must be ready to make personal sacrifices. They must be able to make personal sacrifices to realize that if this thing continues, it will be a threat to democracy. It will be a threat to many of us as individuals. You can imagine many of them say that they cannot go back to their local communities because of fear of terrorism. You can't travel by road. You know, you can't right. go to your villages. So it's a, it's a, it's a threat to all of us. Yes. And we it's must be prepared to make sacrifices individually as Nigerians and as political office holders and also as the state itself. The state must be able to make sacrifices. Okay. The kind of money we're investing on political office holders has to be reduced so that we can put more into, you know, into social services. I have Dr. Sule Yao Sule joining us from Kano. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, Mr. Ayo, good evening. How are you? Good, good evening. Day, how are you? Good Thanks. evening, Pa. Yes. Uh, you see, this uh, tagging of Nigeria as the most terrorized country in Africa, honestly, is not a good comment. At a time when we are battling with a fragile economy, we are looking for direct foreign investment. And how, how could someone think of coming to invest in this country with this kind of comment? How would Nigerians be looked out outside this country? So it means every Nigerian is a potential terrorist. Because your country has been described or has been placated as the most terrorized country. So it means that most of your citizens may turn out to be terrorists. Whereas that is not what is obtainable in, on the ground. I think Nigerians need to talk to themselves. For years, this problem has been owned. We are yet to find solutions. Then, if the security cycle or the security management of this country could not find solution to this problem. Why can't we Nigerians come together and discuss so that we can find solution to our problem? Are we continuing to live in this kind of situation? We are being branded all kinds of things? No. We need to do something. Nigerians must 
Nigerians must act. I, I said that, um, Wally was talking about the fact that we are now under threat. Uh, people can't travel the way they like. In Bono State now, the big people now use helicopters to go from location to location. Helicopter? Yes. You know Bill, the Maduguri Bill Road is extremely dangerous. Hmm. Yet, when the Chief of Army Staff's uh, daughter um, had a wedding recently, big men needed to be there. They had to go by helicopter. Hmm. People like uh, Ali Dume had to go by helicopter. Hmm. This is a fact. You dare not go by road. And I've been talking about this thing for so long. Some people, when you say they will think you are a liar, oh, yeah, it's a rabble rouser. But we've seen a senator from Borno South, Senator Ali, Mohammed Ali Ndume, coming out to say that he cannot oh, it's over. Yeah, go to his uh, hometown because the place is not safe. And we've seen the Speaker of Borno State, uh, House of Assembly, also coming out to say the same thing that there's not a single soul in his uh, local government. Not, not town, oh. the whole of the local government. Not even soldiers on ground. Everybody mm. has fled. That's all. Terrorists have chased us away from our homestead. So how much longer can this go on? That's a huge expanse of land, uninhabited by people. Some of them have relocated to Niger Republic. People in Abadam local government, where you have Malam Fatori, the mm -hmm. town where Colonel Abu Ali was killed. They are now in the uh, Niger Republic. So if you want to give anything, the governor had to travel to give palliatives to not, them in, in, in Niger not Republic. Not forgetting that when this government was coming into power, part of what they, they used to campaign mm -hmm. is we are going to defeat terrorism. And they yes. even put a timeline. Mm -hmm. I remember those billboards across the country. Mm -hmm. no, the, ABC, sometimes sometimes before you get into a place, you think it's going to be easy. But the best thing is to always uh, apply caution. I think they, I have forgotten the time. Yes. Put, Remember, they, they, those people we have the seen even commanders of Operation Lafayette Adole, some of them boasting that, look, within 100 days, we are going to cross these people. But we've had so many of them, mm. and they've not been able to cross Boko Haram. Mm. They always chase the way, removed from, uh, from service, usually uh, when things get very bad. So. The truth is, we have not defeated Boko Haram. The government may have boasted that it was going to do it. But by the time it got into office, it saw clearly that look, the thing was greater than we thought. The, uh, and the, the president the has asked repeatedly that, how, how come these people have not, they've not finished killing them? <laughs> because you have to look at the recruitment. Hmm. They, pay, they go to Niger Republic, give young people dollars. BBC did a documentary on it. They give young people dollars and they come and join Boko Haram to fight. We have to look at how they get the even people. Our people. Even our people here they too. Use, yes, they also, poverty, they, they are hungry. Co no, they conscript our people. They force some of them. When they raid a village, they take people away. They force one of them to fight on their side. Some, they offer money. They've given people loans in the past. In the Madagali area, they gave them loans. I remember going to uh, Adamawa and I came back to say people were being given loans by Boko Haram. Many people didn't believe me until the spokesman of the army came to confirm it. They are giving our people loans. Loan that my, my loans that to pay back. Well, they know you will not be able to pay back. Poverty so. is endemic in those areas. And when you are unable to pay back, they will come to your house and take you into the bush with them. This is what we are going through. We can't do elections in uh, the places that are dangerous. We do elections inside IDP camps. Go and check 2015, 2019. 2019. The bulk of the elections in Borno, Borno State States were done inside in IDP Asia. camps. If those places were safe, were well, we not going to do elections there? The people from Borno North, they, were, they did their election in the IDP camp in Monguno. I say this because I, I, I'm very certain. All right, moving forward now. A cloud of uncertainty still hangs over the fate of the suspended chairman of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, Ibrahim Magu. More fireworks could emanate from the Justice I.O. Salami-led presidential panel investigating allegations of fraud against Magu. The Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Abaka Malami, has expressed readiness to testify in the hearing 
of a petition he uttered against the suspended chairman of EFCC. Magu, on the other hand, says he's willing to testify before the panel and Diaz Malami to show evidence that he received bribes and enriched himself. But actually, now I'm getting the texture of this thing. Mm. It's now becoming a very personal thing yeah. between Ibrahim Mustafa Magu and the Attorney General of the Federation. Very much so. Because that letter that even uh, led to the setting up of the Ayo Salami mm. inquiry and everything emanated from the Attorney General. Yes. So it's a clash of interest between these two men. Mm. And power play. Power play. And it has been difficult to look for something to hang Magu onto. And this panel is still At sitting. At least up to this moment. Up to this moment. And mm. this panel is still sitting. And there's a challenge now. Mm. And Magu is saying, look, Con, uh, 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 Malami is saying, I'm ready to come and testify against yes, him. Yes, because he, he, he wrote to the panel, the lawyer wrote to the panel, demanding that the person who accused him should be brought to the to come and face the panel and explain. Okay, uh, Magu's lawyer, yes. that's uh, Wahab Shitu. Wahab Shitu wrote to the panel that the panel should summon him the to author. come and defend the allegations he made hmm. against Magu, if you are an accuser, then provide evidence of what you are saying. And that is what the law says. And the law empowers this panel to invite any Nigerian, wherever he is based within the borders of our country, to come and defend himself. I mean, to come and provide evidence of any uh, allegation that he has made, you know, to pro produce documents. Mm -hmm that will enable the panel, panel do its work uh, conscientiously. I think it should so, be simpler that yes. way. So that is what, that is what um, Shitu latched upon, that look, this is a man who raised these allegations against me. Bring him, let us uh, face each other, eyeball to eyeball. Let him provide evidence that, oh, I stole also amount of money. It's not enough for newspapers to be it's carrying amazing. reports. It's not enough for Nigerian newspapers to be doing what even Magu himself enjoyed, what we call uh, uh, media, media trial. Media trial is rubbish. I've never believed in it. I've always condemned it. So whether it is Magu that is the victim of it or not, it doesn't make it right. For those who do not like him, it, it serves him right. But some of us are not wired like that. Whatever is not good, we talk about it, whether that person is the enemy or not. So it's not a matter of how many days. The panel has been there for more than two months. <laughs> the person who was accused has not been invited to come and respond to allegations against him. I mean, I've never had this kind of thing in my life. Oh. You accuse someone of sundry allegations, and he's just waiting there. What do you mean? One what month, do you mean? As in, two Mabu months. Has not stood before the panel no, to actually no. defend himself? No, no, he's not been invited to come and defend himself. Yet you brought people to come and make all kinds of allegations people against was prosecuting him. Yes, EFCC. Yes, people like Dauda Lawa. He has cases against them. They are in court, but you bring them to come and talk. You bring the lawyer of some of the people that is prosecuting. You bring the lawyer to come and talk about him. They are not going to make him smell like roses now. They are going mm -hmm. to say negative things. But you should give him the chance to respond to those. Allegations. Is Malami ready to come and testify against him? That is what he said. But whether he uh, so will be, whether the, I will appeal to him to please uh, go there. We want to see a final, I mean, a, a conclusion of this matter. They, they cannot, the panel can't be sitting forever. The other day when we were talking about it, somebody said, leave them, let them do their work. Uh, we have more pressing issues than uh, uh, sitting for uh, indefinitely. The president was talking about 45 days the other day. Now, count how many days they've been, the, the panel has been set up. I see that two months. So, the Ayo Salami should just invite Since Malami has, and Magu and... He said, it, he said it on TV that he's prepared. That the, once it is done within the ambit of the law, as the Attorney General is prepared, that in the past he had responded. Now, let's have uh, you defend uh, yourself. Because a lot of, okay, look at the issue of Dezani. Both of them are accusing one another. Magu claims that he wrote to the man to push for the extradition of uh, Dezani. Yes, with the British authorities, but I never got a reply. 
But Mag uh, Malametu is accusing him of being the one that uh, caused the extradition to, 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 to not happen since. So let them face each other. The one who has documents to defend himself will now produce those documents, and Nigerians will, be, uh, will have clarity about all that is going on. I think it's a good thing for the Attorney General to live up to his promise and go and face. Uh, it should live all right to the panel. Uh, panel, let me come and do this. Because I've I, told Nigerians I, I that this man. The petition. Yes, I've told Nigerians so many things about this man. Let me come and prove that everything that I said is true. Wale Adewe, now looking at this now, it's dragging on and it's becoming difficult to, you know, I don't even know. Magu is suspended. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's still under suspension now. And the Magu's lawyer cites Section 5CC and Section 6 of the Tribunals of the Inquiry Act, blah, yes. blah, blah. But the bottom line is that it has been difficult to actually get to the head of this allegation against the suspended chairman of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. Well, the... The Justice Minister made a 22 count charge against the former EFCC, acting EFCC chairman. Mm. Uh, in a normal society, uh, the third day, or even the second 24 hours after, the Justice Minister should have appeared in that tribunal, come up with files. Mm. Tons of files. Look, I allegations. I want to prove that I'm right. It's very unfortunate that we are reading more pages of liver saying that you will not mind to appear before the tribunal. It's, it's, not the, it's, 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 it's mandatory for him to be there because he's the one that's accusing Magu mm. that he has committed very grievous offenses. So it's not a question of whether if they call me, I'll be there. Normally, he should have been there to present, to defend the allegations that he made. Right? I've been issue. So it's unfortunate that he had to wait. In fact, Wahab Shitu wrote, I think, about more than two letters. The first letter, the second letter, the third letter. Say, look, it is time for you to come and defend these allegations. He is in the best position to defend the allegations that he made. Mm -hmm. It's not above the law, the rule of law, and he has also admitted it. But I'm not, I'm not impressed by this over dramatization in the media, saying that if they invite me, I will come. He should be there. It's over. It's over two months now. Mm -hmm. Because if he fails to appear, it will raise a lot of fundamental questions about the credibility of the trial in itself. You know, and we are also worried about the fact that the, the trial is about a, a, an issue of public interest. But the public, they, we have no access to that trial. So we, we want to see a situation where the justice minister will be cross-examined. Bagu will ask him questions. They will look at each other. And then I think this is the only way we can establish the veracity of claims of the justice minister. If he fails to do this, then a lot of Nigerians will believe that the case of Magu is just a case of witch hunting. All right. We'll take this breather quickly. When we come back, we'll talk more. It's still Journalist Angle. We'll be right back after this timeout. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Julie, even Magu's pastor has um, sued the um, FCMB, that's First City Monument Bank, yes. for the mistake of crediting his account. Mm. That coincidence, <laughs> it still baffles me till tomorrow. Mm -hmm. His account with millions of naira. What impact would this have on the trial? Because how? You are saying a pastor, um, Magu give the pastor it's, money it's to go and purchase a, a property mm -hmm. in Dubai, mm -hmm. and at the same time, FCMB at that time mistakenly credited yes. <laughs> a huge sum amount <laughs> into, into his account. Into so his account. That is one of the the, the people believe that Magu is guilty as, as charged. That is one of the strongest points that they are holding on to. That how did that kind of money find its way into the pastor's account? The pastor's account? Now, the, the, the FCM people have explained that it was a mistake and that they took the, the, that they uh, redressed it immediately. But they did not announce that we made this mistake. They did not tell anyone. That was a but mistake. But they, they were saying that so many other Nigerian the customers of the bank were affected on that day that it was just an error. Like a computer error or something. So now they're not latched on it. Now um, yes, the the I think the NFIU people latched on that one to 
to say, okay, uh, these people that say correlation is the one who buys houses in Dubai for him. Uh, how come when he traveled to Dubai, the pastor was there, you know? So now the, the man has decided to go to court. So that, 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 the bank, apology, that kind of mistake. The apology by the bank is not enough. Why is it is, at that time, that kind of mistake? Is, is Why it should it happen? And when it happened, what were the steps that you took? Did you, you know? Write an apology because if you are taking you... those steps, they will have protected the pastor. Mm. Now, before Nigerians, they look like thieves, like people who are conniving, the money launderers and all that. But you merely say, oh, this was a mistake and that uh, you were sorry. Well, the man decided to go to court. And I believe that that's the best way to defend himself. This same Magu we, was accused of bungling the P, P and ID uh, case. You know, mm -hmm. and he put Nigeria at the risk of losing 47 billion naira. Mm -hmm. Only for a, a, a judge in the UK to be praising him that they did an excellent job of investigating the thing. So, so many things are wrong. That's why we are waiting for the uh, panel to finish his work after more than two you months. You can't sit in perpetuity. You can't sit in perpetuity. <laughs> you know? Oh, just to. No, it's becoming so, so difficult to. It's looking money. like Baba Uputa's uh, panel. Uputa panel had so many issues to deal with. But at the rate we are going, they have to extend the dragnets to even directors in EFCC. People are on suspension as we speak. Did a the lot people of did the work just to that nail. saved us on this PR and I did it. Mm. The, the boys who did the investigation, they are all in, uh, under, under suspension. suspension now, including the secretary of EFCC. They are all under suspension. So the truth is, even this, this panel should do its work. Please. I know it will not end up here. This matter will still go to court. If you recommend that Magu should be prosecuted, we are not preempting their uh, decision. It will still end up in court. So this is just the preliminary stage, and it should not be. It should not last forever. That's the point. Because it's already now more than two months, and the president said forty-five days. So even if you are given an extension, to, for how long are you going to be given an extension? It's becoming more difficult. <laughs> Wally. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, <laughs> what we started like something that we're going to get to the root of the matter. <laughs> if Magu was culpable, we'll know on time and he has been asked to step aside pending the time of the investigation. Mm -hmm. He has not been removed as the EFCC chairman. He was just suspended mm -hmm. and asked to step aside pending yeah. this investigation. But what we are seeing here is something that looks like <laughs> it, it doesn't, there's no end to this on site. Yeah, I, I think justice delayed is justice denied. I, I think um, at the beginning, there were two opinions. Some people felt Magu was corrupt, you know, and they were anxious to see how the evidence would be provided and then the state to prove, you know, those allegations. But I think after people have waited for two months, a lot of Nigerians are shaking their mind that this appears to be a the kind of... Media uh, went. No, we can't. <laughs> we can't. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I think uh, gradually, uh, Magu is becoming the, the hero, you know, in this contest between himself and, uh, and uh, the justice minister. Because this is two months going, and then everything we just hear is More about people, like the record, you know, repeating the same allegations over and over again. But there has not been any grain of evidence provided, I mean, prevents, presented to the public to convince Nigerians that Magu was actually... Uh, you know what? What they reported, him, uh, what what they said about him. They said he built houses in Dubai, he built houses in uh, UAE, and we can't see those uh, those houses. So I think, <laughs> and I'm worried that the past two months, the the the, the, the discussion about you know uh, uh, corruption, even the fight against corruption is is going. To, I mean, it has I mean, it has receded. Hmm. You know, if you hmm. look at what is going on over the country, hmm. unlike that over the job some two months. The, 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 the and the international community cut there, and they should, they should know it. about mm, it. Mm, mm. How we are going to mm. do judge this to it. ultimately? Yeah, uh, <laughs> well, I, I just, what we want is fair play. Be fair to him. If he's a thief, provide the evidence. With the same Maybe. mouth, you know, that Nigerians are praising him, that same mouth they will use mm. to deal with him decisively. Mm. If he's found guilty of corruption, because we have no evidence whether he's clean mm -hmm. or he's not clean. That's yes. why we're asking. Provide the evidence What's so that we can. this matter can come to an end. Wale Adoyu, thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you. And um, Bikyo, thank yeah. you also for your contribution. And that's our offering today.
Join us tomorrow for another episode of the program and watch journalists hang out on our platforms showing on the screen. On YouTube, youtube.com slash TVC News Nigeria. Our feedback channel is Journalist Hangout at TVC News TV. I'm Ayodele Zubaku. Bye for now and God bless Nigeria. <laughs>